thank you very much to Sea and Society for inviting me to, to talk about this very interesting subject. So I'm going to talk about the welfare of fishes, and this is a subject I've been working on for the last um, 22 years, and it's something I'm very passionate about. And so I've spent a lot of my time using my research to inform government and public bodies about their regulations and their guidelines with respect to the treatment of fishes. So what I'm going to talk about first is um, the opinion, the different opinions people might have with regards to fishes. Then I'll talk about sentience. And we often think about uh, when we actually decide to protect an animal and give it special welfare considerations, we ask whether it's a sentient being. So I'll talk about what is the definition of sentience and then what is the evidence that fishes are sentient. And then of course, the crucial point for protecting an animal under law is whether it is capable of suffering. And so this um, question of pain perception in fishes is particularly important. And again, I'll talk about the definition of animal pain and the evidence that there is available to, to show that fishes are capable of pain perception. And finally, if we accept that fishes are sentient beings and that they are capable of pain perception, well, then we have to think about the way that we treat them. And of course, then we have to think about the welfare implications. So how do we use fish? Us humans have a very complicated relationship with fish because we see them as a foodstuff, a very important foodstuff for our growing populations. And so we farm them in aquaculture. We also go out to uh, the, our oceans and seas, lakes, and catch them in large scale fisheries. And so we need that protein to feed our growing populations. And of course, they're a very popular foodstuff, especially here in Sweden. And many people enjoy going out into the environment and catching fish either as for sport um, or uh, as a hobby as for rest and relaxation. Some people keep fish in their homes, either in tanks or in, in uh, ponds in their gardens. And uh, they're a very beloved pet. They're something like the third most popular pet. And in terms of numbers, they are the most populous so we keep more fishes than we do cats or dogs. But also we pay quite a lot of money to go somewhere like Universium, uh, a public aquarium, to look at fishes. And we find that really rewarding and educational. And finally, we use fishes in research. And of course, I do that. And in Europe and in Sweden, we actually use more fish than rats in experiments. And we're using something like 60,000 fish a year in experiments in Sweden. And they've become the second most popular experimental model really in Europe and certainly across the globe. Now, just to explain something uh, to you, um, I uh, take an animal welfare perspective, but there are many groups that take an animal rights perspective and there's quite a big difference. I have a great respect for the animal rights perspective. Um, I, I care very much about animals, but animal rights groups believe that we do not have any right to use animals in any format. And so, for example, we have uh, people for the ethical treatment of animals, Peter, who had a very uh, famous campaign where they were trying to um, ban angling, catching fish and basically make the point that you wouldn't do this to your dog. So why would you do it to a fish? And it just so happened that on Saturday I was out and about in Gothenburg and I came across um, an animal rights uh, protest. And you can see it's, it's quite um, dramatic and, 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 and quite shocking that they, they are uh, basically have this person on the pavement covered in a net and uh, fake blood. And um, we see here that they agree that fish feel pain too and that we need to think about that when we're using them. Me, on the other hand, I take an animal welfare perspective and I believe we have the right to use animals, but we should do so humanely. So we need to work out how the way we treat animals affects their well-being. And of course, there, we use animals for human benefit. So, for example, uh, this is um, a European example where we look at the millions of euros in terms of economic return 
uh, from 2008 to 2011, we make a lot of money by catching fishes in the sea. And you can see we catch many thousands of tons and it's estimated that we catch a trillion fish every year from our oceans. Also, if you go to rural areas, um, for example, I'm from Scotland, so I'm going to use a Scottish example. Rural areas of Scotland don't have much income in terms of, of, of funds and angling, the catching of fishes, brings in a huge amount of money to these rural areas. So there is a benefit to humans there for uh, people to come and, and pay for um, things that they need or pay for um, licenses to fish. However, you have to accept that when you catch a fish, you're causing it damage, and that tissue damage might give rise to the sensation of pain as it would in humans. You're taking them out of the water, so they're suffocating in air, and also you can use, some use small fishes as bait fish, so they basically catch a small fish and then hook it alive and use it to catch a much larger fish. And there is the potential for pain there. We also catch fish at sea and we catch huge numbers. Um, sometimes we catch very large fish such as these tunas and to get them on board there, we use gaffs and of course that causes tissue damage. We also catch species that we don't want um, and these are called bycatch discard. Again, they're, they're here on deck in air and so they can't breathe, they're suffocating. Um, and you know, we pull the fishes out of the water and we could abrade them in nets so there could be more damage. Here you can see the result of a trawl and you can see that there are fish here that are damaged. When you uh, pull the trawl along, the fish become exhausted and they might get damaged on the net or at the end of the trawl and you're obviously pulling out a huge amount of fish from depth, the swim bladders burst and that could be painful and then they're crushed under that weight. And so myself and uh, Dave Wolfenden wrote a review about this uh, what are the welfare implications? But I believe we could do this better. I don't believe we should stop. I think we should find ways of improving the way that we catch fish. And in aquaculture, obviously, there are many things that we do to fish, for example, size grazing. We keep them in very large numbers in close proximity. That can lead to a high transmission disease of disease. For example, you can see uh, uh, the salmon louse here on this salmon, uh, which is sadly succumbed. Um, and this is taken from a cage in uh, Scotland. So, you know, there, there can be welfare issues that are particular to aquaculture. And of course, the European Food Safety Agency have guidelines that we should be following um, in terms of improving the welfare of fishes. And then, of course, we use them in experimentation in very large numbers. Uh, so, for example, here what you can see is the tail um, of a zebrafish, and it's been clipped. Part of it's been removed for genomic screening, which is a routine procedure. And uh, 10 to 14 days, the, the fin has regrown, but, of course, we're severing nerves and causing tissue damage, which might give rise to pain. Um, and I've been involved in a, a number of different regulations where we've, we've said that fish are capable of pain perception and we need to recognize that and reduce it. And we need to think about trying to use less invasive, less damaging methods. And finally, we also um, uh, keep fish as pets and in public aquariums and something like 4,000 species of fish are kept. They're very expensive. So if you want to buy a sand tiger shark, you need to have um, 23,000 euros to keep it. Um, and so we have to think about all the things that we do to these fish. Are we keeping them properly? They're allowed to be transported in little bags for up to three days. And myself, Dave Wolf and then Tom Pottinger have shown that that's stressful after 24 hours, but you're allowed to do it for three days. And you have to think about their health and welfare. Of course, you want your pets to be in good welfare and you want your fish, the fish in the aquarium, which are incredibly expensive to be in good health. And so we have a variety of issues that are particular to fishes and we have a complex relationship with them because we see them in a variety of different ways. However, are they sentient beings? Should we be giving them more consideration? And so here I'm going to define sentience for you. And uh, I refer to Don Broom. Don is a, a animal welfare researcher at the University of Cambridge. And he brought out this um, very interesting and easy to read book. And um, I've added to Don's definition of sentience um, with the text in blue. So if you're a sentient being, you should have some ability, not 
full ability, but some ability to evaluate the actions of others in relation to yourself and to third parties. So, so can you actually evaluate what others are doing? Do you understand what they're doing and how it affects you and others? And I would say that's can the fish form relationships? Can you remember some of your own actions? Do you have learning and memory? And I would say that does the fishes have a significant amount of a cognitive ability? Can you assess the risks and benefits of your environment? And I would say, can the fishes make decisions, behavioral decisions based on that assessment of the risks and benefits of their situation? Do fishes have some form of feelings? Do they have positive feelings, a positive affective state? So do they seek a pleasurable experience? And do they have negative affective states? Do they experience pain, fear, and distress? And can others, the impact of others, if, if you see someone happy, you feel happy. If you see someone sad, you empathize and you feel sad. Can fish show this? Can they empathize with others? And finally, they should have some degree of awareness of themselves and how they relate to the environment. And I would say they need to be conscious. And that's a, 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 the perspective of I and how I relate to the world and, and how I relate to others. Do they have a, a, a sense of I? So I'm going to show you some empirical evidence that ticks all of these boxes because Behaviorally speaking, I can find you an example of a fish that can do anything a mammal can do. And so I hope at the end of this presentation, you, you, you will agree with me. So let's look at forming relationships. So for example, can fishes form relationships within species, within their own group? And what we have here is the rabbit fishes. These are coral reef fishes and they live in pairs. And what they do is they communicate signal with each other and that benefits each other. So while one is feeding, you can see here, this is the feeding one, head down into the coral getting food, the other in the pair is being vigilant and looking for predators. And that behavior is called direct reciprocity. And we only find that in a very few species of mammals and birds, but here we have it in a fish. And this is a very complex behavior because you have to be able to understand the actions and intentions and subtle changes in behavior of the other and signal your actions and intentions to the other. And this direct matching of behavior is a very complex thing to do. So here's a video of them doing this. So you can see one is being vigilant, one is in the, the coral crevices feeding. And then they decide to switch behaviors and so they change positions. And actually this benefits the fish because they take more bites and can penetrate deeper. There is another benefit of course, and here it is. One is being vigilant and the other is feeding. Then they scatter because there's a predator on the loose. And so they can signal to one another and avoid predators. Now, can fishes form relationships between species? And this is a very famous example of a grouper who's asking its moray eel mate, do you want to go hunting? And so it's head shaking to the moray eel, which you can just see here in the crevice. And off they go together, swimming together. You can just see the moray eel's tail and they go hunting together. And in effect, the grouper is here, it's head down, it's pointing to some prey, but it can't get to it. So it sends in its mate, the moray eel, to flush out the prey. And they actually get more food when they hunt together like this. So even between species, they can communicate and act, act for their mutual benefit. Now, what about learning and memory? There's a great myth that you know, fish are a bit thick and that they only have a three second memory. Um, and that's not true. So here's a video to prove it. So your fish does nothing. Until now. <laughs> so sorry about the music, um, not my choice, but certainly um, you can train fish to do pretty much anything. And I had a colleague who um, worked on goldfish and said that they can remember for up to three years, not, not three seconds. 
And so there are other species of fish that can do complex things. So for example, this is the tusk fish and it feeds on, on these hard shelled animals and it needs to break them open. And so it uses a tool and the tool is rocks. Um, and so what you see here is the tusk fish is finding um, its prey. And then once it gets its prey, it will swim off with it. So it's got the prey in its mouth. And I'll just fast forward here to where it's breaking. So it's using this rock here, as you'll see, picking it up, bam, trying to open the shell. And it keeps doing that until it opens it and it gets the reward. So that is tool use in a fish. And this other example, um, this is the archer fish here, which spits out of the water and hits its prey. So it's fantastic eyesight. And it has, um, a, you know, it has to be used quite complex computation of seeing through the water and actually hitting that prey successfully. And what this study did was it tested the archer fish and showed that it could remember 44 faces with 93% accuracy. I'm not sure I could do that. But basically, the fish spits at a face and gets a reward. And you can see it here in this video. So the fish comes up, it's shown some faces. Bam, hits it and gets a reward for doing it. And so that shows that um, they have a cognitive ability. What about assessing the risks and benefits of a particular situation? Well, in this experiment, we have um, cleaner fish, and I'm sure you know cleaner fish sit on coral reefs and they create cleaning stations. And client fish, big prey uh, predator fish, come in and get cleaned all the parasites off them. And so the cleaner will clean the client and um, in effect, of course, they'll eat parasites and mucus, but actually the skin is much more nutritious. So occasionally they'll bite their client. However, um, of course, if they're being washed, this might not be such a good thing. So this test looked at the amount of bites of, of skin of clients when there was an invisible bystander, so they couldn't tell they were being washed. And when there was a visible bystander, so they could tell that they were being washed by a potential new client. And, what happened, of course, was that the cleaners were less likely to bite the client if they knew they were being watched, because, of course, they wanted to get the new business. And so they do assess the risks and benefits of their behaviour. In this example, um, we're looking at whether the fish have positive feelings and will seek out that positive feelings. Again, this is a surgeon fish. And what we have here is the model of a cleaner fish with some brushes on it to give a massaging action. And so we, the model is moved back and forth. And what you can see here is a video. Um, and in effect, the surgeon fish lines itself up with the brushes and gets a nice massage. And much like us, after we have a massage, we feel much calmer and less stressed. And when the, the researchers measured the stress levels in the fish after the massage, they were much lower than if the fish hadn't had a massage. So they do seek out positive uh, interactions. But what about um, negative feelings where um, you see another animal displaying, for example, fear behavior? And this expounds on zebrafish. And what they did was they had zebrafish, they had demonstrators which were exposed to either alarm substance, which is a predator cue, an orange, or um, just water, a blank and blue. So when you apply water to the fish before they're not showing any freezing behavior or very little, and they show less after the addition of the water or no change. However, when you add this predator cue, the alarm substance, you see a great change in freezing behavior, and that's a natural anti-predator behavior. Then you can look at the observers who are watching them in the tank next door, and what you can see is that they also freeze, but yet they don't get any alarm substance. So they haven't got any cue, but they see their neighbor is freezing. And so this is called fear contagion. Um, we'd call it empathy, but in animals, um, it's it's preferred to call it contagion, so that you catch fear rather than you actually sympathize. 
And, and it didn't matter whether the observer or the demonstrators were familiar to each other or unfamiliar. So finally, are fish conscious? And the, the gold standard in mammals is the mirror recognition test. And what you do is you show an animal a mirror and then um, they, if they recognize themselves in that mirror, the next time you put something on them and they should try to get rid of that because they realize there's something on themselves. And again, it's our friend, the cleaner fish. And in this case, a red dot was put under their chin here. And basically, yes, they did recognize themselves and they scraped off on the substrate. And this is just um, a little video, um, if it works where the fish um, are looking at themselves in a mirror. Most fish, when they start, they actually try to fight themselves because they think it's someone else. However, eventually they realize that this isn't and they start performing strange behaviors. So for example, the cleaner fish is swimming upside down in front of the mirror, which it never normally does. And then when you put the red dot on, they try to scrape it off. So that would suggest that they recognize themselves and they have a sense of I and who I am and they're conscious. So I think we've ticked all of these criteria that I explained to you earlier. And so I would say, yes, fish are sentient beings and, and that they can do anything a mammal can do. How does that affect the way they, that we treat them? So, for example, what are the legislations and regulations? Well, we know in Europe we have scientific um, regulations. The EC directive says that we should treat fishes as you know, as if they experience pain and we should seek to minimize that. And so they're treated in science the same as mammals. The Farm Animal Welfare Council, which uh, produced the five freedoms, one of, one of them is that animals should be free from pain in aquaculture. And um, they do say, they do accept that fish experience pain. In the UK, we have the Animal Welfare Act, which only covers companion fish, not fish that are wild, um, and there was a prosecution. There was a spate of um, people drinking live goldfish. Um, and of course, you can see that the 200 euros fine, 600 euros legal costs and, and banned from keeping animals for 12 months. It's quite small, really, considering that someone actually killed a fish um, uh, for fun. Now, I've only touched on a, a tiny amount of things that fish can do, and you can read much more about this in a, a book chapter that Colin Brown and I wrote on the mental capacities of fish, fishes. They are amazing and they can do so many more things. The next topic I wanted to cover was animal pain and do fishes experience pain? Myself and colleagues came up with a set of criteria that scientists can use to, to decide whether fishes can experience pain beyond a reasonable doubt. And I wrote this with my colleagues and it's been cited over 200 times. And what we basically said was that animals um, should respond to potentially painful events in a different way from non-painful innocuous events. They should also change their behaviors. So they should alter their strategic behavioral decision-making after a painful event such that they don't perform normal behaviors and they should avoid those behaviors. So you can ask yourself, do fish have the receptors that we have, these are called nociceptors, that detect painful stimuli? Um, and do, do they um, have pathways to the central nervous system, the brain? Um, and is their activity specific to noxious stimuli, these painful stimuli? And what I can say is yes to all of that. Um, fish do have nociceptors. This is work I did many years ago where I showed they, they have the same uh, neurons as us um, and see these C fibers and a, a delta fibers here. These act as nociceptors in our nervous system. Um, and this is just some mapping of where these nociceptors were found in a very early study I did. And these nociceptors, they respond to um, high mechanical pressure, cutting, crushing, um, extremes of temperature, so uh, above uh, 40 degrees Celsius, which would be painful to us, and also noxious chemicals like acids and venoms. And so 
I can tell you that uh, fish do fulfill all of the criteria for animal pain. So what should we do about it? And, and some of the work I've been doing now is really uh, motivated to try and improve the welfare of laboratory fishes. Um, and of course, we can extrapolate fishes in agriculture and other situations. And this particular um, project looked to develop an automated intelligent monitoring tool for zebra fish. Now we use over 60,000 fish in Sweden per year, 36,000 of those are zebra fish that are very important model species. And so it's important that we can assess their pain and then we can use painkillers or analgesics to reduce that pain. And so what I did was to develop an intelligent monitoring tool by collaborating with engineers at, at, at Liverpool. And they'd already developed a monitoring tool for use in a dementia care home where patients couldn't convey their, um, it, you know, their internal affective state. They couldn't say how they were feeling. And of course, we can't speak to fish. So and when, by putting video cameras in the day room, they could identify patients which were immobile or agitated and then provide help. And I thought this would be a really neat way of, of doing this for fish. And so we looked at um, zebra fish subject to an, a number of different treatments in the lab, control and disturb fish, sham fish, which were anesthetized, but nothing was done to them, fin clip fish, that's where you remove part of the tail for genomic screening, insertion of a pit tag, which is done for biological monitoring, muscle damage, which happens during surgery, um, subcutaneous injection of acetic acid, which is like vinegar. Um, and we looked at individuals, pairs and groups. And what we found was that um, healthy zebra fish continuously swim. They swim in midwater, very calm swimming with gentle turns. However, when um, zebra fish are subject to a potentially painful event, they are immobile. They use the bottom of the tank. You see very uh, strange bursts of erratic swimming and unusual behaviors. And so we look at this example, we can see that this fish is being tracked. That's why there's a red dot on it. And it's swimming constantly. It's um, swimming in mid water. And I'm sorry that, about the quality of the video. It's just, um, uh, we have to um, turn down the resolution so that we can track the fish in real time. And that fish is normal and healthy. It's an undisturbed fish. Then we have this fish here, which is actually um, the video started. And what we can see is that the fish is sitting on the bottom. It's not going anywhere. And that fish has had a thin clip applied, done under anesthesia, but pain relief is not usually given. And then we have a fish here, again, in the bottom of the tank. It's actually sinking, which is quite unusual. And then it's bouncing on the bottom of the tank. And that fish had a pit tag inserted through the abdomen. Again, it's done under anesthesia, but pain relief is not provided. And here's a final example. The fish is swimming in mid water, swimming continuously. And that fish did have a fin clip, but we gave it a drug with analgesic pain relieving properties in the tank water and the behavior was more normal. And this is the type of data that you can get from this. This is the, a diagram of the tank. And this is where the fish has been for 25 minutes. The green dots are slow swimming, red dots are fast swimming. So controls are using all of the tank. The sham treat fish are using all of the tank, but you can see there's a dramatic reduction in space use and activity with fin clip pit tag insertion, muscle damage, and exposure to um, a low pH chemical. And then we can test different pain relieving drugs. For example, lidocaine at five milligrams per liter, very effective and fin clip fish at preventing those behavioral changes. However, pivocaine at one milligrams per liter, not very effective. Then we have flunixin here at two milligrams per liter, not very effective. However, eight milligrams is. And then morphine, three milligrams per liter, not very effective, but 48 milligrams is. So we can see that after fin clipping, the behavior is more normal. We then uh, produce this health index, which basically takes the, the behavioral data in real time. And then it either gives it a color, which is either normal in green, okay in blue, unhealthy in yellow, or abnormal in pink. And it works on, it works on the last one minute of data, last 10 minutes, this is a fin clip fish, which is coming up as a normal. 
And what you can see here is the health index. The fish is being tracked. This was a normal fish. We paused, we anesthetized. And if you keep your eyes here, it's going to refresh after a minute. But it's coming up as unhealthy because we fin clipped it. And you can see it refresh and now it's become abnormal because the fish is very immobile. And that uh, has been published and it's free to download. And what I hope is that people will use it to improve welfare in laboratories. Um, I'm an idealist and I'm pleased to say I'm getting downloads from across, across the world. Excuse me. Um, and basically, um, we've developed this for groups of fish. So this is a chromatic fish analyzer. We take uh, data directly from the videos. We can see the fish are very bright against the dark background. And so we can calculate activity by the change in light saturation. We measure hue vertically and horizontally. We can see where the fish are in the tank and we can measure clustering, how close the fish are together because when fish are stressed, they become very close together. And we, we're now uh, uh, with um, colleagues here at Gothenburg applying this to rainbow trout and hoping to develop it into a tool for aquaculture. In terms of what I'm doing to promote fish welfare, I'm actually part of a FLASAD. This is the Federation of European Laboratory Animal Science Association. I'm developing a pain management report with colleagues um, and I'm convening that. So we're hoping to provide a user guide that laboratories can follow to improve the welfare of fishes in laboratories, of course. So what can I tell you about pain and fish? Well, um, I haven't had time to show you everything I wish I had, but it's evolutionary conserved. Um, so it's very similar to the system that you find in mammals. If fishes are capable of pain perception, then we need to think about reducing um, any welfare implications or any uh, pain that is, uh, we subject the fishes to and think about the use of, of analgesia. We call fish fish, but you wouldn't call a rabbit a mammal. You wouldn't call dogs and cats mammals. There's actually over 35,000 species of fishes, um, and we need to think of them on a species by species basis. And we should be seeking to avoid minimizing and alleviating pain when we use fish. What are the implications for welfare then? Of course, there's many things that we do in aquaculture and fisheries that I think we could improve. Um, and so we we can think about ways of, of reducing the impact on the fish such that the welfare is improved and we produce welfare friendly food. And it's the consumer, the general public that drive welfare changes. So we need to be prepared to demand and pay for better welfare. We can also think about ways of, of improving recreational angling or sport fishing, using uh, barbless hooks and, and using knotless nets. We can also think about the things we do in research. Can we employ analgesia? Can we do less invasive techniques? And of course, um, in terms of companion animals, we need to have a good understanding of the husbandry of these animals and how we can keep them in good welfare. And I have to say one thing is that we do things to fish that we would never allow to mammals. And um, for example, you know, in, um, in some countries, um, in fairgrounds, we allow um, the use of goldfish as a prize. We wouldn't be giving away puppies or cats, it just wouldn't be allowed. Um, the same with farming of fish. This is a, 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 a picture from a Scottish fish farm, a sea cage, and you can see that this fish has been infested by the salmon lice and lots of its skin is missing, and that's bound to be painful. If you saw a dog, cat, um, or cows or sheep or pigs in a field covered in parasites, there would be a public outcry. We just wouldn't allow that to happen. Um, and also um, in public aquaria, there is a great need, and I've worked with public aquaria, for um, the animals to be kept in good welfare. And they do provide a, a powerful education and conservation role. Um, and so, again, though, they need to keep their animals in good condition. Now, we could ask the question, what would happen if we accepted fish are sentient and experienced pain? Well, pause for effect, we accept cows, pigs, sheep, chickens experience pain, but we still farm them. And I think there is a barrier to accepting fishes as sentient beings. Um, and actually they can do all of these things that I've shown you. And so we should be giving them the same welfare consideration that we give to mammals and birds. 
I uh, spoke to Carl Safina about this. Um, he's a journalist who writes a lot for um, different newspapers. And he comes to the conclusion, he's a very keen angler, loves catching fish, that actually, is it too painful for us to admit that fish feel pain because of all the things that we do to them and the things that we accept? And I think that's quite an interesting perspective coming from someone who likes to catch fish. This is um, a, an opinion poll for a practical fish keeping magazine. I do a lot of public outreach and um, I did an article for them um, and they asked, do you think fish can feel pain? So this is people who keep fish and we can see 96% say yes. And so I hope that um, in some ways that I've influenced your opinion now and um, you now think of fish in perhaps a more um, welfare friendly light. And if you want to read more about this, I uh, wrote a, a recent chapter in The Welfare of Fish, which is a really good book in terms of looking at lots of different aspects. So just to acknowledge all the researchers, collaborators and funding bodies for all of um, um, enabling all of this work. Thanks to the fish, of course, who participate in these experiments, not voluntarily. And of course, thanks very much to you and to CN Society for asking me to give this talk. Thank you very much.